Welcome everybody. Nare, thank you for this beautiful, beautiful film, this heartfelt poem. <laughs> and your beautiful crew for making this happen. Filmmaking is the art of a vision, but it takes a village to make a reality out of an idea, a passion, a hope. So I congratulate you, your colleagues, and everybody who believed in this film. Uh, before we got started tonight, I know you had a few words you wanted to say, some personal heartfelt words about your beloved professor. So please have a seat and let it go. Thank you. First of all, um, this is working, right? Um, first of all, thank you all so much for coming. It's so special for me to screen my documentary at USC Film School. Um, it's extremely special because it's a documentary about the Armenian genocide. When I was going to this film school, I never imagined I would have the opportunity to screen a documentary about the Armenian genocide at the best film school in the United States. Um, it's actually the first time in my life that I'm screening the film and I'm more excited than nervous. I think because USC feels home, I really feel like I'm home right now. Um, I'm grateful to USC Film School for doing the screening. Actually, USC School of Cinematic Arts. <laughs> Um, and I'm grateful to USC Institute of Armenian Studies and USC Shoah Foundation for making this come true. I'm so honored. Um, there is one person that I thought would definitely be here and I would get the biggest hug from. It's Kenny Hall. And some of you knew him. He was our beloved professor. And he was more, way more than a professor. That's the reason why I'm talking about him. <laughs> Um, when I first started film school, I was this immigrant who was pursuing big dreams. And Kenny was this amazing person with the biggest smile and the biggest heart who would tell you that you can accomplish anything. And um, he gave the best hugs. And I was so certain that I would come out tonight and I would go to that hall and Kenny would give me the biggest hug. And I will ask him if he was proud of the music because he was the reason why I met the amazing Sherry Chung, the composer of the film. Um, he passed away last week, and um, I just had to talk about my Kenny. But now we can talk about the film. <laughs> Thank you. Bravo. And as an alumni from this school, graduated uh, 18 years ago, I know the beauty of this school is the mentors that we have, and the filmmakers who embrace you as family, and my my beautiful mentor is Woody Omens, who's the cinematographer. So this school really was nurtured by the filmmakers who not only looked at film as storytelling, but who looked at the students as family. And this is not a infomercial for USC School of Cinematic <laughs> Arts. <laughs> but it is a dedication to the necessity of mentorship, to the necessity of storytelling, to the necessity of people that encourage you to break the boundaries. And more now than ever in this digital age, we have to break the boundaries because by breaking the boundaries, you discover the stories that have been repressed. And as minorities, as immigrants, as Americans, as third world citizens, as first world citizens, cinema, Jean-Luc Godard once said in the 50s, he said, one day everything will become cinema. And everybody thought he was nuts. Well today, Facebook, YouTube, Skype, our lives are cinema. Mm -hmm. We sneeze and we take a video and we send it to our cousins. So we think audiovisually, and through thinking audiovisually, we're able to expand the narrative of humankind. And more so than anything, now in the 21st century, as Armenian immigrants, as descendants of genocide survivors, as 21st century Americans, there is a chance now that there's never been before as Mexicans, as Guatemalans, as Koreans, as Tibetans, to tell the stories that have been repressed. And as I was watching this film, I teared up many times because part of my life is spent in Istanbul, in Constantinople, in Western Armenia, and a lot of these images are very, very, very dear and near and painful to me. I just want to start by saying thank you for having the bravery and the courage to go to Constantinople, Istanbul, Western Armenia, Eastern Turkey, Yerevan, Tizer Nakabert, and to tell this story from a very personal first-person POV because I think this was a documentary that needed your voice. 
So let's just begin as all things begin with the origin of things. What really sparked you to tell this story? Besides the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. Uh -huh. Thank you, Eric. First of all, it's so special to me that you're moderating this event because uh, you're the best person to do it and I'm so honored to have you here. Um, I wanted to tell a personal story. My grandparents were survivors of the Armenian Genocide and uh, my... Okay, <laughs> I have that problem always. Um, my grandparents were survivors of the Armenian Genocide and my grandfather's family, they were all killed um, by the Turks, but my grandmother's family, they were rescued by their Turkish neighbors. So in my own family, there was the story of the good Turk and the bad Turk. There was the story of the dark and the light. And I always struggled with that conflict of, you know, the enemy and what is the enemy? Because if my grandmother ended up as Nuria and she stayed in Turkey, I could have been raised thinking that I'm Turkish. Could I have denied the genocide? Maybe, because it would have been in my identity. So I really wanted to tell a story, a human story about the genocide. And I wanted to see the other side a little bit. Um, and try, it's very difficult to not judge but to try to not judge as much as I possibly could. And it was extremely difficult. Absolutely. Um, it's not easy. Yes, but I want to see them on a human level. And when I went to Turkey and I was walking on the street and I was looking at all those eyes of the people walking, I was thinking which ones are the eyes of, a kill of the killer and which ones are the eyes of the people who rescued my grandparents. Um, and one of the biggest reasons why I made this film was to simply start some kind of a dialogue because I believe that if there is change going to come, if there's any change, it's not going to start from any of the presidents or the government. Mm -hmm. It's going to start from the people who were brave enough to march on the streets after Hrantink's assassination and say we're all Hrantink, we're all, we're all Armenian. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the very personal reason why I need to film. No, it's, 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 uh, I've, I made a film about seven years ago in Istanbul and I remember the first time I was shooting, um, this gentleman on the street came and he found out I was Armenian and he said, you know, he said, blood has memory and you are the echoes of that memory and you are the echo of tonight's memory. So I want you to talk about your wonderful collaborators because you ha had this vision, this passion this need, this uh, calling to tell this story. How did you come about making it a reality? Because filmmaking is originating with the vision of a filmmaker, but without the beauty and the passion and the sweat, the blood, the tears, the 4 a.m. emails and the 7.27 a.m. calls, <laughs> you cannot get a movie done. So I just want to salute the crew that saluted you in helping you make this film and please introduce your crew members. Thank you. Um, well, I wanted to make this film accessible to non-Armenians because I thought, as Armenians, we know the genocide by heart, we know exactly what happened, and we know it was a genocide. <laughs> but non-Armenians don't know about it, and I wanted them to know about the genocide. And I thought what would be the best way for me to tell the story, and I realized it would be, the best way would be to have non-Armenian crew because they would make it accessible to non-Armenians because some things that I assumed were very clear to non-Armenians are not very clear. Um, and the role of the editor was so extremely important for me because I think for documentaries, uh, the editor is like the second director. So I looked very, very, very long <laughs> and I found the amazing Amy Rosner. Give it up for Amy. <laughs> She really was the second editor of, uh, second director of this film. We were stuck together in a dark hole for the longest time, and we enjoyed every single second of it. I think. <laughs> um, then Ileana Guevara, who is the executive producer of the film, it's actually so special to have Ileana produce this film. And as we were standing in the back. I was looking at her and smiling as I can't believe it because Ileana and I, we went to film school together. We met in 2006. 310. <laughs> Purple. 
<laughs> we met in 2006 in Mardik Martin's class, who yeah. is this amazing Armenian screenwriter who wrote The Raging Bull, New York, New York, and many other amazing films. He was supposed to be here, but unfortunately, health didn't allow him to be here tonight. Um, yes, so that's Ileana Guevara, and she was... Bravo! And she was actually one of the main reasons why I made this documentary, but it's a very long story, so I won't bore you with it. And Christina Malavenda, who was the head of production, and she's the executive producer on the film. She, I was so surprised because I went to her and I said, I want to make an Armenian genocide documentary. And she said, yes, let's do it, but let's find a woman. And I thought, okay, Christina, so I'm trying to make a documentary about the Armenian genocide. I'm trying to find a Turkish person with Armenian heritage who will be brave enough to talk about the genocide in front of the camera, and I'm having such a hard time. And on top of all that, you want it to be a woman, and you want her to speak English. Sure. <laughs> Sounds great. But <laughs> thanks to Christina we Malavenda, her. we found her. And I want to say special thanks to Rob Fried, who is the producer of the film. Unfortunately, he's not here. He's sending his son to school. Uh, but he is an Oscar-winning producer, and he greenlit the project, and he's so proud of the film, and I'm so extremely grateful to him. And um, also, I have to say that Sherry Chang, who is the amazing composer, is here. And I want to say thank you so much, Sherry. Sherry, stand up. And I met Sherry at USC also. Thank you. So let's begin with the boat. And the boat that sails every movie is the character. How did you find Maya? And where did this inspiration come from to follow her on the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide to Yerevan from Istanbul? Uh, so I went to find someone who had Armenian and Turkish blood in her. Um, and um, I had different ideas and it really all started with Ilyana and I talking about System of a Down because they were going to have <laughs> a concert in Armenia for the 100th anniversary and Ilyana was going to she loves System for Down. I was thinking, let's do a concert movie, you know, because <laughs> it was the first time they're going to uh, play in, uh, in Armenia. So I thought it was really interesting. And that's how I learned about the Armenian genocide when I was going to school in San Fernando Valley, System of the Down. So I really hold them really close because they were the ones that taught me, a Guatemalan American, what the Armenian genocide is all about. Bravo to Serge and the yeah. brothers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Are you related to Che by any chance? <laughs> I, I hope. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> I'm re we're related. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She has the fire. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it started with System for Down, but then I was thinking the screamers have, or have been made already. I want to make something different. Thank you. I know. <laughs> that will help. Um, so I want to make something different, and I thought, okay, what if I make a film about all these Armenians going to Armenia for the 100th anniversary and show that, you know, this is a nation that survived, um, our culture survived, the nation survived. But then I thought, not I, come on, like dream bigger. And I thought what would be the best scenario and I thought, okay, I always want to do this film, which originally was a narrative piece to write a film about a Turkish person who finds out that they have Armenian heritage. But then I thought, why not find this person and make a documentary? Uh, I looked for her for a long time. I contacted many politicians, many historians in Turkey and in Armenia, and they were all telling me that I'm not going to be able to find anyone with Armenian heritage in Turkey who would be willing to talk in front of the camera. Um, so, Eventually, I found her in a Facebook group. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I'd like to offer a little bit of context for the non How many non-Armenians are there? Because I can see. Yes, it's necessary to offer a little bit of the context of um, how many. Do we have any Turkish friends in the audience tonight? Hoşgeldiniz, anybody? Unfortunately not. Um, Throughout 
the 20th century since the Republic of Turkey was founded in 1923. There's a story I'd like to tell just to give context to how the Mayas of the world are now able to tell their stories and then we'll segue into the specificity of the filmmaking. In 1923 when the Republic was founded after the ashes of the Armenian Genocide, after the ashes of the Pontic Greek Genocide, the Aegean Greek Genocide, the Assyrian Genocide, the Chaldean Genocide, this whole chapter of the genocide, it does not belong only to Armenia. You are gravely mistaken if you think that it's, it was only the Armenians. This was a battle of empires becoming nation states. And when an empire becomes a nation state, it has to create a mythopoetic mythology to justify its existence. So when 1923, when the Turkish Republic was founded, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the founder of modern day Turkey, um, took under his wing a very, very smart, very educated gentleman by the name of Hakop Martayan, who he named Dilajar. And Dilajar in Turkish means language opener. And Hakop Dilajar Martayan was given the task of converting the Ottoman script into Latin because Atatürk wanted to look west. And when that happens, when a nation state converts its alphabet from Ottoman Arabic to Latin, it creates a ground zero, a year zero, where everything before that year becomes slowly non-existent. It fades into memory. It fades into oblivion. It is somewhat the forbidden taboo subject that you do not look beyond 1923. So the irony of the Turkish Republic was that an Armenian was tasked with converting the Ottoman script into Latin. And when you do that, you cut the root of future generations into understanding the essence of the story because the oldest public servants in the world are storytellers. They outlive the, the politicians, they outlive everything. Before there were republics and empires, there were storytellers. So by changing the alphabet, by changing the language, you change the selective memory of a nation. And I kept thinking about this in the scenes on Istiklal Jadisi when you were interviewing all the different people about the genocide. Yes, no, it didn't happen. Yes, it did, but you're not gonna remember something bad you did. So the reality that, the big reality we're facing today in the 21st century is that the Turkish Republic will continue to deny the Armenian Genocide. God willing, there may be some change now with Germany re recognizing it, with Pope, the Pope recognizing it, with so much going on in the name of the cause. But the bigger fear, the bigger sleeping beauty here that is actually a tragedy is that every day, every year, more and more Turks in Anatolia, in Western Armenia, like Maya, are coming up and saying, we are Armenian. We have been denied the chance to accept, to acknowledge the fact that we have this identity in our blood. We, have, we are hidden Armenians, but we want to come out. And this truly is going to be the biggest vanguard, the biggest evolution or revolution moving forward in the 21st century. So the fact that this brave woman was able to allow you to enter her home, enter her heart, is truly an important reality because majority, how many of you have been to Turkey? When The more you go, the more the stones cry out to you. And again, going back to the movie, I just wanted to offer that context just so you understand the gravity of the situation is that we are facing a new generation of Turks who are Muslimized Armenians, of Turks who are happy being Islam and they are happy being Armenian. It, we are entering a generation where we have to redefine what it means to be an Armenian. And this is the bottom line. There is no other way. We have to accept the spoils and the pain and the horrors of history that we cannot change a hundred years later because these people have been denied this for a hundred years. So films like this, I commend you again so much for having the passion 
and the gravity to be able to go and tell this story. And I want you to talk a little bit about your own emotions as you were making this film and how you came across constructing a documentary. Because here at SC, we learn fiction filmmaking and we, we learn to, you know, to modulate and calibrate storytelling based on these ideas of three-act structures and whatnot. But documentary, reality, and whatever happens to you is your narrator. So how did you go about finding the story? Um, I can talk about Nari's emotional journey. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, yes, she definitely. <laughs> you start, and then I will add to it. Yeah, I think, well, because finding the story was such a partnership with us because I think, like, anyone who is an editor or has worked on a documentary knows that the story is found in post. I mean, there's so only so much you can do when you're shooting a documentary, and Nari had such a beautiful vision um, and knew, like, the feelings she wanted, and our conversations were so amazing, and we loved working together. Like, I can't tell you what a especially with an all-female team, is like the best. Respect. <laughs> um, no offense to anyone, but... Um, so I think the thing is, is like we had so many conversations and I think that's what documentary is about. I mean, narrative has that same quality. You know, you talk about the story all the time and the characters um, and you go deeper, but there's something about documentary because you can really throw the pieces in the air and tell it the way you want to tell it. And this was a really hard story to tell because Maya was such a complicated character. And I mean, I, it, it's funny watching it now because there were so many iterations of this film and so many versions. And, you know, we had to have, I mean, there were days where we just had to walk and walk and talk. And we laid on the floor and we mm -hmm. talked and we cried and we talked, you know, because, and that's a beautiful process. And I would say, like, it, for, from an outside perspective, it was really interesting because Nara had so many emotions going into the post-production of this film. And she had been through so much and then having Maya's character be as complex as she was and say it wasn't genocide. And I think there was a lot of mixed emotions, which I think everybody can understand. And so it was kind of like this really great I hope this is okay I'm sharing this <laughs> but I think it was a really great like therapeutic experience for Nare definitely for sure. yes I always joke with Rob the producer I tell him this was a very very expensive therapy thank you so much <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes exactly Amy and I we were stuck in this dark little room and we did a lot of talking and I did a lot of crying actually now that I remember yeah, because Honestly, now I understand I had to go through that whole year of so many different emotions mm -hmm. that I experienced with Maya and feeling her like so close to me because I felt like we were kind of like mirror images of each other. Her going to Armenia for the first time, me going to Turkey for the first time. Our great grandparents, they were all from Siva. Mm -hmm. So we really started at the same dot, but then we ended up at the complete other side mm -hmm. of this dividing line, her denying the genocide and me fighting for the genocide. And when she denied the genocide, I really felt betrayed. Um, and I felt betrayed mainly for Nuria, actually, because I thought, oh my God, like you told the story of your great grandmother, you gave the facts, you gave the facts. Mm -hmm. and then you can call it genocide. I felt so betrayed. But then throughout the process, it actually, what I did, like I forgave her and I loved her and I was so grateful to her for being so brave and I completely understood her. Mm -hmm. I understood that denial has so many layers. Uh, I feel like a lot of us, we look at them as monsters in a way because it's like they're denying but no denial has so many layers and in a weird way what i was thinking is you know i feel like we're stuck in different stages of grieving process <laughs> uh they're stuck at the denial stage and armenians have crossed to the anger stage so we're kind of stuck in the anger stage but we still have to get to the healing stage but we need each other to get to this healing stage Absolutely. we really do um it was a very long emotional process really i went through so many emotions and i'm so grateful to have such an amazing team to 
be there for me and see me cry and <laughs> go through all this different emotion. How is the film, if it is, and different from what you initially envisioned it? Ooh. Did you know what you were getting into? Or is there, what did you discover along the way that you didn't expect? Or did you? I did not know what I was getting into. The f funny thing is, like, I, um, I feel like I dived into the ocean, mm -hmm. but I didn't realize how deep it was. And when I came back, my mom, she was saying, oh my God, I actually, while you were doing it and you were working on pre-production and you were like, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I was thinking, this girl is crazy. She's not really understanding what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And in a weird way, I guess I was not. Because as the plane was getting closer to Turkey, I was fe feeling like this extreme fear. And it wasn't even fear. It, I can't explain it. Because as you said, it's in our blood. And I really believe that it's in our blood. Mm -hmm. Because there wasn't anyone with a knife or a gun pointed at my head. I knew no one was going to kill me. But there was this unexplainable fear. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I got to Turkey, I was actually the next morning. <laughs> the next morning I woke up and Ilyana and I, we were in the same room because she also was the second camera on the film. Um, and I was literally shaking. Mm -hmm. I was literally shaking. I have never experienced that in my life. And I was shaking so bad. She crawled into my bed. <laughs> it was a tiny little bed. She's like, can I cuddle with me? <laughs> not, not only and I crawled was a scene into her in the bed, film, but I too. asked her to hug me. <laughs> there was a scene about this too so in the film. Me, I'm uh, I was, uh, yeah, I was extremely scared to be there. Huh? Oh, thanks. Access of the mic. Access wow, of the are mic. You a sound designer? She is. Uh, she is my sound professor <laughs> from Valley College. Thank you. Access of the mic. Access, Access of, the mic. of the mic. Thanks. How are we doing on time? Do we have some time? Yes. So there's so many questions to ask. I encourage all of you to please ask away here during the reception. Um, I just want to end with. Um, a salutation that I don't know why in the beginning there was all this wonderful montage showing history as we look at history through the eyes of a TV set and then you go from this TV set from all these politicians and these world hooplas and this noise and you're with this quiet woman in a room struggling with her own existential crisis struggling with the truth of the fact that you look into her eyes and you know she knows deep inside what had happened. But words mean something. And until the day comes when you can call a thing by its rightful name, genocide, it's not up to us to judge and to hate and to be angry. I think this generation now versus 20 years ago, very different. But the beauty of cinema, the beauty of the school, the beauty of the, the, the temple, the synagogue, the church of cinema, is that you're allowed, you're able to, with your passion and your love and your gift and your humility, to tell a story and through the eyes of telling a story, to open up a human truth, a conscience, to even empathize with somebody that you have such deep reservations toward because of what words have done to us, what empires have done. So I commend you, ladies, for your bravery, for your passion, for being a tribe, for being an SC tribe, for more importantly, embracing a fellow human being. And I commend you for your vision and your passion. And I think the testament to all your passion and beauty is that all these wonderful people have showed up on a Thursday evening to be here with you and to be enlightened. So please engage the duty of mankind, regardless of any failure of politics, plutocracy, democracy, is for mankind to make peace through dialogue in some capacity. And what you're doing now is what the cave dwellers did 8,000 years ago by sitting in front of a fire and telling stories. And now you're watching it through a digital medium. So engage, don't be passive observers, talk to these wonderful filmmakers and continue this dialogue and shed light on the issues and the stories that need to be told. Thank you very much for coming. Fire away. <laughs> I talk too much, but I hope it makes all sense. So please raise your hands. And yes, ma'am. Um, kind of I was shocked that Maya uh, was so much more than Maya. 
Mm -hmm. uh, she actually denied the genocide right before she left Armenia to go to Turkey. It was on April 24. Um, I dealt with it very, it was very difficult for me. It, I really felt like I was betrayed. Um, because as Eric asked, I guess I didn't really answer the question, but I was expecting to make a very different film about this Turkish woman with Armenian heritage who goes to Armenia for the first time. But I think this was way more interesting, to be honest with you. Now I'm kind of grateful. I think that was the treasure um, because it really shows the conflict. And what I really wanted to do, I wanted to humanize the conflict. Um, there's a lot of history that is written, there are numbers, but I think as human beings, we engage with human beings. And and while we were making the film, I was also always telling Amy, this is not a genocide documentary. The genocide is the backdrop, but it's about identity. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the 1915 section is only 3% of the film, because also I feel like as audience, we, um, we lose our attention when it's too much black and white images and when it's too heavy, because we, as human beings, we shut down. Um, so, but back to your question, so she, when she denied the genocide, it was extremely difficult for me and I didn't want to make the film. <laughs> I didn't want to make a story about the woman who denied the genocide, but then through a lot of conversations with Amy, um, I realized that this was the treasure. And right now, after watching the film, she loved the film. I was so horrified. I was really scared because I didn't know how she would react. Because I was thinking, oh my God, this was so difficult for me as a filmmaker to watch, to make the film and share it with the audience. And I was imagining how difficult it must have been for her. But she loved the film and she actually said that she cannot believe she didn't have the guts to call it genocide. Um, and she's planning to come with me to UK next month to for the screening and she's a big supporter of the film we call each other sisters I'm grateful to her for healing me she really did I mean I'm not completely healed I think it's a long process but I'm really grateful to her for everything she has done to me uh, for me um, yeah so she has changed and to me, that was actually the biggest victory. Because when I was making this film, I was also telling Amy all the time that this is a love letter to Maya. <laughs> um, and I wanted, we almost called, yeah, we almost called the letter to Maya. Um, and the whole time that I was making it, I was saying that the Turkish section is for the Armenians and the Armenian section is for the Turkish people because I want them to understand each other at least a little bit. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. I'll repeat them. Sorry. Thank you, Anna. Is Maya safe now with the political turmoil in Turkey? She is safe. She was actually um, in Florida for a while, which I was very happy to hear. But now she's back in Turkey. Um, she's safe but I'm very worried and that is one of the reasons why I'm not arranging to screen the film in Turkey yet, even though I would love to. Um, but I feel like I would only screen it if she moves to America. And may I just add, nobody is safe in Turkey now anymore. <laughs> Actually, Having just true. returned from there. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, yes, that is true, yes. Yes, sir. No. Can everybody hear the question? Uh, 
Okay. We didn't know. We went like we actually didn't. I didn't know the rule, but Nada was like, "Let's go," and I was like, "Let's do it." <laughs> and we Honestly, went. Honestly, <laughs> um, we had a male um, cinematographer with us, Jeff Dolan. He was yeah. the main cinematographer. Yeah. Uh, but Ileana was with me, and somehow I thought if it's two young women, maybe we'll be more safe. We look like students. Yeah. So, that's so I like. told Jeff yeah. not to get involved, and I said, okay, let's go do this. It was actually very scary. At first, I was very scary because I wasn't sure what was going to happen to us. But then as time went by, I think like it was a bigger mission. Like It was just bigger than who I was. I was there to find the answer. So kind of I forgot about the fear and we just did it. But it was it was kind of scary. Yeah. And just to add to <laughs> some historical context why you could actually now go to Turkey and talk about the genocide. Up until 2007 before Herat Dink was assassinated this was largely an impossibility. 301 AD the article that basically then if you, are, if you talk about the genocide or you, you know, speak about it publicly, you will be prosecuted for insulting Turkishness. After his assassination, they thought they would silence the man, but they gave birth to a new generation of Kurds, of Greeks, of Armenians, of Turks, leftists, who got up and they said, we will not back down. Now, that is a micro-minority. By no means, I want you to think that Turkey is on the cusp of becoming a democracy. It is not. That is a micro-minority of artists and leftists and hardcore human rights activists that are a micro-minority, and I stress micro-minority. But it is, it is the micro-minority that's the drop on the stone that cracks the stone. So the reason why you're able to actually... The genocide is a public secret. You know, majority of the people who are educated know what had happened, and they're learning what had happened. And thanks to the Turkish historians who are talking, like Taner Akçam, like Umit Kurt, Umit Ungur, you know, like our friends Khachik Muradian, all our brothers and sisters who are actually doing these conferences, like the Herant Think Foundation, they are educating the public through dialogue, through these stories. So, the reason why these ladies were able to actually not be arrested or not be taken in is because that, you know, that windshield has been cracked by a little pebble, and slowly it's spider webbing, and now. The, the intelligentsia is able to talk about this, not freely by any means, but it is not as taboo as it was before 2007. Oh, and by the way, um, sorry, to get the permit for the film, because we had to get, have a permit to film, there was this Turkish production company who took us under their wing, and they did it under their production company's name. They didn't even mention my name, because I was literally filming two days before April 24. Um, so they didn't want me to have police following me. Mm -hmm. So he did it under his production company's name. All the help that I got from the Turkish people was amazing. Uh, that was a healing experience too, to be honest with you. And I'm so, so grateful because I feel like the Turkish people who accept the genocide, they go above and beyond to apologize for what their ancestors have done 100 years ago. And that is too, and that's so sweet. Two more questions, please, because I feel like the wine is waiting for everybody outside. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, unfortunately, Alex has passed away, uh, and she didn't have any information about Alex's Actually, Alex didn't have family. He wasn't married. He didn't have family. And uh, she didn't know anyone who would know Alex after all these years. But we are trying to look for uh, Nuria's family, her great-grandmother's family, uh, because I personally really want to find out her real name. I think it would be so special to know her real name if she deserves it. Last question. I'll take five dollars, ten dollars, twenty, twenty-five. We we always get this question, and Amy always answers. Here we go. <laughs> okay. The question was. Yeah, I'm, I'm repeating it. 
Um, sorry, no, <laughs> I've never been here. Um, so he asked if Nuria never talked about it, how did Maya know she was Armenian? So it is a complicated story, but basically, um, Nuria, oh God, I can't, it's been so long, but she would take, she would, she would read these letters, like her relatives had left and gone to the United States and she would take, um, Maya's mother on these trips with her and she would see her mother speaking a different language and she would you know, see her crying over these letters and these pictures and she didn't really understand what was going on and then like uh, slowly it came out. I mean, Yeah, so Nuria had a brother who moved to the United States. His name is Horan Pelikian and he tried many times to contact Nuria but um, the contact never really happened. Um, I think once she said that I have already lost one family, I'm having, I can't lose another family again. And um, at first I didn't understand it, to be honest with you, because to me it was like, well, you drop everything and you go to your brother. But then I wrote, I uh, read The Bastard of Istanbul, mm -hmm. and there was an extremely similar story to that. And what I realized was, if she went to see her brother, there's no way she would go back. Yeah. And um, she couldn't, she couldn't lose a family again. Um, so, yeah, so she had a brother here, and um, Maya's mother would always go to an Armenian church with Nuria, where Nuria would read these letters in Armenian, and she would cry. And then once Maria's mother was playing in the garden, and they were saying, oh, those are the children of Gabur. Mm. So... Gabur kind of means infidel. Non-Muslim. It's the old Ottoman word for uh, non-Muslim minorities, the Greeks and the Armenians and the Assyrians and the Chaldeans. And actually the reason why she, Maya's mother started talking about her being Armenian was Alex, because when they started living in Alex's home, Alex was Armenian and he took them in without knowing that Maya's mother was Armenian and then when he found out, they started having a conversation because they said, oh my God, I'm Armenian. And she said, well, I'm Armenian too. And that's how Maya found out. It's just was, it was such a long and complicated story we tried to fit in, but it was just very long and complicated. There's so many people, we journeyed from Vaughan all the way to Dikranakert so many times, and every village you go that was an Armenian village that's now a Kurdish village, suddenly when people know you're Armenian, they just come out screaming and talking. And when one village particular, they just said, you know, Anahit, Anahit, Detroit, Detroit, do you know her? Anahit, Anahit, Detroit, Detroit, do you know her? And we were like, we'll go to Detroit, <laughs> we'll try to find, but it's very, very painful. There's so many, so many of these stories that happen over and over. And I highly recommend for those of you interested, there's a magnificent book by Fethiye Chetin called My Grandmother. And this lady was her aunt Dink's lawyer who's written the story of her grandmother and how she found out she was Arme Armenian. It's a, it's a painfully beautiful memoir that really puts into context what these ladies experience as well. Thank you very much, truly, for being here, for supporting this movie, coming at USC. Thank you to the School of Cinematic Arts, the Armenian Institute, the Shoah Foundation. Thank you for making movies matter. <laughs>